we began to be babysat and one of the persons that would babysit us was one of my uncles and he began to molest me. And this started at about the age of five and it continued till I was about 11. And so when my dad would come and pick me up, he was just so upset that I did not want to be touched. I didn't want to be hugged. I didn't want him. I would just push him away and say like, no, like, you know, no. And so he took offense because he was like, what did I do? Why are you treating me this way? What's wrong? I mean, he was upset. He was crying. And even now, you know, thinking about it and talking about it, my heart breaks because my dad lost his little girl at that point. I was no longer the same person. I became cold. I, I said I didn't want to be touched. I didn't want to be hugged. I didn't trust anyone. I'm going to start back to when I was four because that's kind of when I can see in my testimony a transition of all the things that had gone wrong to God working in me to bring peace and also make them right in my own heart. So when I was four, my grandma and my two aunts lived with us. And during this time, my two aunts were younger teenagers. And for some reason, they thought it would be really funny to basically torture us. I had four brothers and it was me, the only girl. And so when my mom and my dad were not there, uh, things started to go really wrong and get really scary for us. Uh, one of the first traumatic memories I have is that my aunts led us into a room and they basically tricked us to go into this room by ourselves. And after we entered the room, they closed the door behind us, but turned off the lights before they did that. And after they closed the door, they began to like bang on the door. And they were yelling, Freddy Krueger is going to get you. Michael Myers is going to get you. The devil's going to get you. And I was still pretty young. I wasn't completely aware of what these things were. But I did know a little bit about the devil and that he was bad. But based off of my brother's reactions at that moment, I knew I should be afraid because they lost it. They turned around and they just started banging on the door and screaming and yelling let us out. Please let us out. I want my mommy. I want my daddy. And because they freaked out, I freaked out. And uh, the only thing I had to say to get everything to stop was, I'm going to tell my daddy. And that's what ended it. And this did happen a few more times. However, it only happened to my brothers and not to me because they were afraid that I would tell them for myself and then uh, get them in trouble. But because that happened, I developed from that moment on a complete fear and anxiety that I felt like I had uh, obviously no control over. It would just come upon me when my parents were gone. I was afraid when new people would come around. I was afraid when my cousins would come around and they would play games. I was afraid to play with them because sometimes they would say like, we're going to play Freddy Krueger or we're going to play this or that. And I would be like, no, I'm not. And I would go hide. Well, at about the same time, my dad and my mom got a divorce. And this was another major event in my life that affected me so much. And so when my dad was leaving, I wanted to go with him. I was daddy's girl. And so I asked him, can I go with you? And he was like, no, I'm going to go wash my clothes. So like he was going to the laundry mat, but he had his dresser in the car and his clothes, his belongings. But I was young enough that I was like, oh, okay, I believe him. Fast forward a little bit and I realized my dad lied to me. And so after that point, I honestly can tell you, I don't think I ever trusted anybody ever again to be telling me the truth. And if I did believe, then there was always that skepticism in the back of my mind, like, oh, maybe you're lying. Um, but anyways, like I said, that put a distrust in me. And there was also something that was an ongoing thing from when I was little to probably the age of 13. And that was that my mom was jealous of me. And so she would say things to me that were not very kind. She would talk bad about my dad to me because she was jealous that my dad would give me a lot of attention. And so I would see the difference in how she treated me and how she treated my brothers. And so I really never felt loved by my mom. I just always felt like she was competing for something with me, even though I did not know 
what we were competing for. So after my parents divorced, uh, we ended up staying with my mom for a while. And I honestly have not a lot of memory of that time, but I was told my dad did not come see us for about six months because he was really distraught and depressed over the divorce. And during that time, supposedly I got closer to my mom. But during that time, we began to be babysat and one of the persons that would babysit us was one of my uncles and he began to molest me. And this started at about the age of five and it continued till I was about 11. And so when my dad would come and pick me up, he was just so upset that I did not want to be touched. I didn't want to be hugged. I didn't want him. I would just push him away and say like, no, like, you know, no. And so he took offense because he was like, what did I do? Why are you treating me this way? What's wrong? I mean, he was upset. He was crying. And even now, you know, thinking about it and talking about it, my heart breaks because my dad lost his little girl at that point. I was no longer the same person. I became cold. I, I said I didn't want to be touched. I didn't want to be hugged. I didn't trust anyone. You know, I think at first I didn't trust people to not, you know, maybe scare me like my aunts were doing, but now I no longer trusted anyone to be near me, to touch me because I didn't know what else would come of it. My mom started using drugs and partying and just kind of, you know, getting a little out of control. And during that time, my, she would have some of our second cousins come over and Sometimes she wouldn't be there. And so I remember one time one of the aunts or one of the cousins coming over and we weren't always fed like we should have been. And so my brother was on the counter and he was going through the cabinets trying to look for something for us to eat. And I was in the kitchen with him and this cousin comes in and she just starts yelling like, what are you doing? And she literally picks up a cord and starts swinging it at my brother over and over and it hits him in the legs and he falls off the counter. And I'm just sobbing and screaming, stop, you're hurting him. Don't do that. Stop. And um, she literally stops because <laughs> I lost all control, was just flipping out. Like, I can't believe you're hurting my brother like that. And, um, you know, she tries to comfort me like, oh, it's OK, it's OK. And I mean, my brother just literally fell off the counter and he was only, I want to say, like five or six, somewhere around there. And um, like, that's my memory of that. And it was just like, man, like, I hate new people. I don't trust them. Well, fast forward and my mom gets married and my dad also gets in a relationship with who's now my stepmom. And so the man that my mom's in a relationship with, I don't really think he ever liked us. And they both use drugs together. And so we suffered because of that. Um, there were times where they wouldn't feed us because they were passed out in the room. And then sometimes we would be sneaking around in the kitchen to try and find food and sometimes even the dog food. <laughs> and if they would catch us, especially my brothers, they would make us kneel in the hallway on tile. And sometimes they would throw ice and you would have to kneel on the rice. And then they would go in the room and they would pass out again and forget they left you there. And so sometimes we would, you know, sit back down and they would come out of the room and if they caught you down, this was mostly my brothers. They would, my stepdad would run a leather belt under hot water and he would spank them. And if they even flinched, he would spank them again. And they have so many more traumatic stories, but those are the only the ones that I witnessed. And so it was always like, man, all these people we were supposed to be able to trust, they would just betray us. My mom, I don't know why she never came out, why she never said anything about it. It was like she was fine with it. My mom had custody of us, and so my dad only got to see us on the weekends and on Wednesdays. So when we would go with him, it was a lot better 
but it wasn't that good. <laughs> um, my stepmom, she was wonderful. I mean, she took care of us. She fed us. She washed our clothes. She just treated us like a babysitter would kind of, or a nanny. She never extended the affection that a mom would. And um, her kids, they were, we were different. Um, we were raised with rules. We weren't allowed to cuss. We weren't allowed to fight. Um, we had boundaries. Some of them were good. Uh, some of them were bad. But her kids liked to fight. And they were raised in an environment where, you know, there were drugs and gangs. And we learned these things. But also when we would go there, the house that they lived in belonged to their father who had passed away. And so when they would get mad at us, they would tell us, well get out of my house. This is my house. My dad left this house to us. We just always felt also out of place because we knew at my stepdad's, there were three rooms, one where they stayed. And then there were his two daughters and they each had their own room. And there were five of us and we all had to sleep in the living room. And so it didn't exactly feel very comfortable or like home. And then we weren't allowed in any other part of the house except for the bathroom. So then when we go to my stepmom's, we were allowed to go everywhere, but then we would get told that, you know, get out, we don't want you here. And it was like, what do we do? I don't know what to do. You're telling me not to be here, but like, I, I don't want to be here anymore because you don't want me here. And all this time, the molestation continued. Anytime we had family gatherings um, or I saw him, he would, somehow have an opportunity to do something to me. It was just awful. So I was always insecure, always anxious, hiding. So when my mom was with my stepdad, um, before they got married, my mom sent us to my dad's for a while and my mom had a baby. And it seemed like we were gone for quite a while. And it was like, okay. And it was like, she's married. And it was like, okay. Like she didn't even tell us any of these things. That's interesting. Um, and so she was kind of in and out of our lives where my dad, I felt like was always consistent. We knew when we would see him and if we were too far away, because eventually, um, my mom left my ex stepdad and joined the army while well, she gave us to my dad. And then she took us back after she was done with her basic training. But even when we moved, my dad would still drive to pick us up bring us back to where he was and then drop us off again. So he wasn't neglectful in his visitations. While my mom was in the military, she wasn't always there. It was kind of weird. She would come home late. Sometimes we'd be like, what do we do? We need to eat. And you know, there were my four other brothers. And so we would try whipping something together. We didn't know how to cook. Uh, and so we would just, you know, <laughs> make a mash, I guess. But because she wasn't there, uh, I want to say my brothers got into a lot of things they shouldn't have during that time. I was always standoffish. I didn't trust him, trust anyone. I didn't trust my brothers because I knew they were, they would get into stuff that they shouldn't. So my mom ends up getting out of the military. We go back with my dad until she's discharged all the way. And then she takes us back. Well, when she takes us back this time, when we're with my dad though, we don't see her for a while and we don't hear from her. So it was like, she never felt like she had to call or talk to us. It was just like, if we were gone from her, we were gone and she was gone. It, there, were, there weren't that many check-ins. So she gets out, gets an apartment and takes us back. Well, she moves us into the ghetto, like drug addicts and a creepy place. And she starts using drugs again. And my mom was promiscuous and we didn't have any doors, but we had like, sheets up as the door and she would be having intercourse in another room and it was loud and very inappropriate very uncomfortable i was always anxious there too well it started to happen again where she stopped having food for us and um, wasn't able to provide so my dad would come over and drop us off food and we would call him like dad we're hungry we have nothing to eat we don't know where mom is uh, we don't know what to do and so he would come and he would drop us off food. And then there were times in the middle of the night, my brothers would sneak out of the house and go swimming at a pool down the street when it was closed. And um, like, I was just always afraid for them. I was always scared something bad was gonna happen. Well, eventually my dad comes over and visits one day without calling, without us calling him. And 
my dad sees my mom's arms are all full of, you know, track marks from shooting up. And um, he just told her, have the kids ready. I'm going to pick them up tonight. And so he came and he picked this up. But I don't ever remember a conversation of your mom's on drugs. You can't be with her. You're going to come with me. You can't stay with her. It was just like that, you know, a new ch a change. So we don't hear from her for a while again. And we hear from her again. Like our life was just so dysfunctional. My mom hated my stepmom to the point of like, it was just so uncomfortable. We would have birthday parties and sometimes my little brother, we had it on the, our birthdays were on the same day. So he would invite my mom when my dad and my stepmom were throwing the party, my mom would come. And I was, like I said, just so scared because my mom really just wanted to beat up my stepmom. There was always anxiety. Well, my mom ends up going to rehab and my dad takes us to visit her. And I remember just a coldness from that point on of, I don't want to be near my mom or close to her in my heart. I don't want to love her. And I wouldn't say I phrased it in that way, but looking back, that's what I wanted. I wanted distance between us that was permanent. I didn't want her to be able to hurt me anymore because she would, like I said, disappear and not call. We wouldn't see her. Um, so I was cold and she was trying, but she honestly never could, you know, just keep it together. She would always find another bad boy into drugs and go that way or, you know, party. So anyways, fast forward, my dad and my stepmom end up breaking up and my mom and dad get back together. And during this time though, this uncle that molested me, we end up moving into the same house where he lives because my grandparents and him lived together. And because they, my stepmom and my dad broke up, that's where my dad moved us. And that was kind of like torment. The molestation stopped at like 11 and he was confronted. Well, I don't know what happened to him, honestly. I don't know what was said to him, if anything other than things for myself had to change. It, like people no longer, the uncles could no longer hug me. They had to shake my hand. I had to shake their hand. So it was evident that everybody knew something. And so all the men would extend their hand and you know, we would shake hands. Uh, my uncle, I don't know if there, I don't really think there was like a change other than he stopped touching me, but he was still loud about me if that makes sense like oh hey da, da, da. i was just like don't talk to me <laughs> like that's how i felt in my heart but i would never say that at that time so when my mom and my dad got back together things were good at first it was like wow like things are normal we're being taken care of we're fed all the time nobody tries to kick us out nobody's mean to us um my mom was a good mom when she was present and trying well, they started drinking a lot and partying and things just went south from there. Fights broke out. And one of the last times my mom was there, my mom and dad were fighting and my mom threw an iron at my dad's head and cut his eyebrow open. And then my dad chased her and I thought my dad was going to kill her, but that wasn't his intention. So my mom jumps out of a window and my dad catches her and he pins her down and he just lets all the blood drip onto her face. And I'm like yelling at my mom, mom, just go, just leave, mom, get out of here, just go. And so she leaves and they're no longer together. And my dad and my stepmom start talking again. And my mom stays gone for a long time again. And then all of a sudden she pops up months later and she calls and she wants to talk to me and she tells me I want to tell you what you did that hurt me the most and mind you I was already cold towards her still I never let her get close to me again and I was like what and she said when you told me to leave that that hurt me the most and I didn't explain to her though that I wanted her to leave because I thought my dad was gonna hurt her. I was like, just go, you know, like get away, run away. You'll be safer if you're not here. But she interpreted it as I didn't want her there, which was not true. And anyway, so she said that. And because I was angry at her, I put the phone down and was like, whatever. And I told my brother, your mom wants to talk to you. So that was a probably Thursday. And my mom was telling my brothers that she wanted to pick up us three bigger ones she hardly ever wanted to pick up my two younger brothers who were literally only one year younger than us and i don't know that was just weird but 
I didn't believe her she was going to come for us. I didn't believe her she was going to pick us up because she would say she was and then she didn't. So then Friday rolls around. She doesn't pick us up. And I think it's probably sometime in the evening already. And my dad was going to go to my stepmom's house. And I was like, well, I'm going to go with you. I mean, I'm not just going to sit around here. So while we were at my stepmom's house, my dad gets a phone call. He came to me and he's like, I have something to tell you. And he was crying. And I was like, what's wrong? Because my dad never cried. And he was like, your mom, she shot herself and she's dead. And I was just stunned, like, what? Throughout my younger years, I did grow up somewhat in and out of the church. My mom was Pentecostal. My dad's side of the family was Catholic. And we did have a cousin who took us to a Baptist church. And so we had some knowledge of God, the devil, the salvation message, but it never was personal. And um, my dad and my stepmom used to send us uh, to a church where the bus would pick us up and take us, but they would never go to church. And so at that point, I rejected God. I said in my heart, there is no God because if there was, he would have never let this happen. And that was when I was like 13 years old. You know, prior to that, I used to always look for the first star because supposedly, you know, you could make a wish and it would come true if you wished on the first star. And it, I was always wishing like, I just want to be happy. I just want to be happy. You know, at such a young age, I didn't even realize how unhappy I was. So between the ages of 13 to probably 21, I full out rejected God and I lived my life like I didn't believe in him. I began to party. I became promiscuous. I began to drink heavily. By the time I was 15, I had my first pregnancy that ended in a miscarriage. And then by the time I was 16, I was pregnant again. And this time I had a baby. And when I had my son for the first time, I could honestly say like, wow, this is what it is to love somebody. Like I've never known this kind of love, not even you know, to my family, to my dad, to my mom, no one. And so a series of events began to occur that drew me to cry out to God. I had my son and then a year later I had my daughter. And when I had my daughter, I had prepartum depression that transferred over into postpartum depression and it was really bad. And I had a really bad struggling relationship with my ex and I just came to a place where I felt like I needed out and I needed I needed to find happiness so that relationship ended and I started going out partying and then I ended up with who's now my husband and while I was dating him my ex sexually assaulted me and that sent me back into an even worse depression where I became suicidal I was severely depressed, had a really bad anxiety to the point of getting on medication. And it, it also started, I started arguing and fighting all the time with my husband. And so every day was an argument. Every day I just took everything out on him. And I felt like any love that I had for anybody was gone. I felt like I didn't like people. And because we were always fighting and arguing, I just came to a really, really low place. And I remember being in the hallway, you know, just in a ball my, with my knees curled up and crying and sobbing. And I just cried out, God, where are you? Why won't you fix this? And from that moment, I literally can see God starting to draw me. It was pretty amazing. Uh, one of the first things that happened was I ended up having my husband um, take me to a hospital because I was serious that I just, I wanted to die. And so I was there for three days and they asked me, what can we do to make sure you never come back here? And I was like, well, I would like a marriage counseling session. And you know, they were thrown aback like, whoa, what? Nobody's ever asked for that. And I was like, well, if you can't do it, then just forget it, you know, whatever. And they were like, no, no, we can arrange it. You know, we'll, we'll have it set up. And so they did. And um, for the first time in a long time, me and my husband, we had a conversation. We hurt each other, even though it hurt but we were talking, we were having a civil conversation. You know, and another thing that I learned while being in there was how immature I was. I thought the world revolved around me, my wants and my desires, and that people should cater to them. And I realized that that's not how the real wor world works. 
I broke down crying in there because I needed a new tray because I put sugar all over my food because I thought it was salt. And I went to my room and I sobbed like a baby, like, honest to God. And I remember hearing in my thoughts, like, look at you, what are you doing? And I was like, yeah, what am I doing? I'm crying like a baby over food. This is ridiculous. Get up and get out there and quit acting like a baby. And I literally grew up some in there. I ended up going to see a psychiatrist who I believe wholeheartedly she was a Christian, but she didn't come out with it because she taught me biblical views without the Bible. And so she would teach me and my husband, because we would have um, marriage counseling sessions at the same time, how to argue and to not argue. And it would help us get along better. But there were times where we would say to each other, well, you know, who does she think she is to tell me what to do? I can do whatever I want. And so this goes on for, I think, like two years. And the whole time she's teaching these concepts that, like I said, are biblical without the authority of God. Well, eventually my husband was in the military, in the military. So he gets cleared to move and we moved to his next duty station. And within the first week of being there, someone invites us to church. And I'm like, well, I don't have anything else to do. And the church is literally down a block. It's not far at all. Like you could be there walking in three minutes. So we start going, me and the kids. And while being there, they say they're having an adult Bible study in the parsonage, which was literally right there on the property. If I wanted to go, I could. And so I was like, well, I don't have nothing else to do. So I went and... It was pretty amazing. I began asking questions and I had legitimate questions and they were so patient and kind and they would answer my questions. And sometimes they would tell me like, we don't know that we won't know till we get to heaven. And so I was left with those kinds of answers too. Like, well, what? Like we don't get to know. But when I was younger and I had denounced God, an aunt and an uncle would take us to church and I would ask these questions and people would literally roll their eyes at me, be smug nasty and walk away from me and i would think fine like if you don't want to answer me i don't need your god you know you're full of it all y'all are hypocrites because when we were at the church there was a bunch of bickering and fighting in there and people fighting over boyfriends and girlfriends and i was like i don't need this this is like high school stuff this is just drama i don't want drama in my life needless to say at a young age i continued to reject god and the church because of all the drama that it had so anyways while i'm at this church i see a few things that catch my eyes there's salt and light at this church i grew up if anybody ever did something for you you better expect that they expect something back in return and at this church people would do things and give things and not expect anything back and so i was just like whoa what is this then i remember i saw my friend she was talking to her husband and i thought he seemed disrespectful and so i was like "Ooh, you're gonna get it and instead of that his wife miles remains patient and calm and loving and responds to him and I was just like wow I've never seen that like how can you be so loving to someone who just treated you in my opinion unloving but again that was the light I was like whatever she has I want it so I continue to go to this church and the way the church was set up I didn't know at the time but basically when someone new came in one of the women would volunteer to disciple the new person and so a friend my my dear friend, her name was Michelle, she discipled me. And at this church, though, they didn't do altar calls. They simply let the Lord draw you. And if you were to get saved, you were to get saved. Not to say that they didn't preach the gospel. The altar call just wasn't given. So my friend's discipling me. She's teaching me all these biblical things. And I start changing. I start wanting to be obedient to Jesus. My life is just radically different. Uh, one of the things she taught me because my husband was an unbeliever and we would still fight sometimes, especially if I brought up the Bible and God. And so she told me, well, there's a way that God teaches women who are married to unbelievers, you know, and how you can win them over with your conduct. And so I was like, oh, I can do that. And of course it wasn't me though, it was the spirit working in me. And I changed, I stopped arguing with him. I stopped being mean and rude and condescending. And there was just a, like I said, a radical change. And one day we were having a potluck at the church and her husband was there. And so he starts asking me, so are you saved? And I was like, well, I don't know, am I? And he was like, well, only you can know that. And I was like, well, how can I know? 
And so he starts, you know, telling me scriptures. I just responded to him. I'll go home and I'll pray about it. I'll think about it. And I went home and I did that. I prayed and I thought and I reflected on the scriptures and my life and my heart. And I was like, I'm saved. Like, I believe, I believe in Jesus. Like, I cannot tell you the day, the hour that all this happened, but it happened. And so after I realized I was saved, I called the pastor and I was like, I would like to be baptized. And so I was baptized into the body of Christ. And here I sit before you, a child of God, a believer. So that is my testimony of how I got saved. But the things that happened after I got saved were also pretty radical. I forgave my uncle who had molested me. I forgave my dad for lying. I no longer held people at his arm's distance that, you know, always thinking, I can't trust you. I don't know you or, you know, getting anxiety because I'm around you people. This actually, I feel like made me somewhat more bold. Granted, I'm not completely 100% sanctified and like Jesus, but a lot of things in my life have changed. I'm not mad at my mom. I genuinely love her. I wish she could have lived a different life. I forgive her for everything she did and didn't do as a mother. I'm close to my dad. I can hug my dad. Everything is fine in that area. I have a great relationship with my husband and the Lord. We have several kids together and we raise them in the Lord. As far as my aunts go, the same. I forgive them in my heart. I hold nothing against them. I love them. And I genuinely love everyone and just really want everyone to know the love of Jesus. Thanks for watching this video. I hope it was encouraging to you and I will see you on my next video. Y'all take care. Bye.